Good morning, Auto95. Thank you for uh, joining us here. We are going to talk about hybrid and EV high voltage safety and safety systems found on some of these hybrid and EV vehicles. We'll also talk about some of the PPE, the personal protective equipment that you're going to wear while working on hybrid and electric vehicles. A couple things I want to mention. This first slide here, you'll notice that you see some warnings and some dangers with exclamation points. You see pictures of electric shock risk. Whenever you see signs like this, these are not guidelines. These are saying, hey, you need to pay attention because if you get in here, uh, you can actually be seriously injured or even killed. So we'll uh, move on to the next slide here. Let's talk about voltage and voltage levels. So there's a couple different voltage levels. The first voltage level is going to be low voltage. That's any voltage that's less than 30 volts DC or less than 15 volts AC RMS. Uh, some of you may not understand the RMS measurement. Uh, RMS stands for root mean square. But basically what it means is if you can visualize an AC signal, in fact, let me grab a piece of paper and see what I can do here. If you can visualize an AC signal, what you'll notice is that that signal actually raises and lowers. So I've got a little piece of picture right here. So what we're looking at is right here, this would be our zero line. We're going to go to a positive voltage, drop back down to a negative voltage, and go back to a positive voltage. If I were to draw a line through the center of that, like this and I were to measure the voltage anywhere along this path right here it's going to climb steadily climb steadily until it hits its peak and then it's going to drop until it hits its next peak the only time where we have the highest possible voltage is at its peak so if I were to take this and draw two lines you can see that those there those are going to be our peaks but anywhere to this side anywhere to this side is going to be some sort of voltage in between. So when we talk about RMS, what we're talking about is what's the average voltage of that AC signal as it goes through its as it goes through its sweep. So 30 volts DC, 15 volts AC RMS. I wish I had a whiteboard and had more space to do that. But we're sort of working with what we have here. So thank you for being patient. Intermediate voltage is anywhere between 30 volts DC and 60 volts DC, uh, which is uh, also 15 volts AC RMS or 30 volts AC RMS. Intermediate voltage, that's where you need to start paying attention. That's where uh, your shock hazards start coming in. And then when we get into high voltage, uh, that's any voltage greater than 60 volts DC or greater than 30 volts AC RMS. That's where things get real. And if you're not wearing personal protective equipment, high voltage gloves, you can suffer severe injury uh, or even death. So uh, the SAE, you guys know the SAE does a lot for automotive. Uh, they brought us OBD2 uh, designations and uh, all kinds of other stuff. But anyway, the SAE J1673 uh, deals specifically with high voltage wiring assemblies. And basically what it says is that any wire or cable or harness that contains high voltage shall be visually identified with a permanent orange harness covering material. So if you look at this picture, what you'll notice is on the right hand side of the, well, the, the, it's the middle of the picture. Uh, you'll see that there's a bunch of orange wires. So right in here, you notice there's a bunch of orange wires. Those orange wires, are uh, basically shielding to let you know, hey, this is a high voltage system. So when you see that type of uh, wiring underneath the car, it's telling you there's high voltage and that you must take adequate precautions while servicing or working on that system. And we'll talk about what that means here in just a little while. Individual cables that are routed separately and not protected must have green insulation on them. Cables that are that are grouped together uh, in some sort of a harness or some sort of an encasement, uh, they must also be orange. This provides technicians, first responders, um, people who drive the vehicles, 
some sort of visual means to easily identify high voltage systems. For those of you who have taken other automotive classes, you know that when you see a yellow wire, that a yellow wire indicates SRS or airbag systems. So in this case, we have yellow for SRS and airbag. We have, we have orange for high voltage. Take a look at this picture right here. You can see that there are three separate wires going into this uh, into this transaxle or, or, yeah, it's transaxle right there. And you'll notice they're marked a UV and W. The UV and W, that's for the different phases. When we get into three phase uh, AC motor operation, that'll make more sense to you. But what you need to know is that those, those wires there are in fact high voltage and um, so they are marked with orange. You'll notice on the right hand side of the screen, there's, there's a, a harness that's covered. It's, it's actually a hard plastic covering on this one. These are the high voltage wires that run underneath the vehicle. You'll notice that not only are the wires themselves orange, if you were to pull it down, but the covering over it is also orange. They want you to know that it's high voltage from the very beginning. Uh, going back to the left-hand side over there, if you if you notice right here, this outer shielding, this outer shielding is all orange. If we were to pull the shielding off, we would notice that, that the wire itself underneath that, the insulation on the wire is also orange. So lots of orange. The effective amperage on the human body. For those of you who have had uh, auto 54 electrical, you know the difference between amps and milliamps. For those of you who haven't, uh, let's make it really clear right now. There is, there are 1,000 milliamps in an amp. To give you some idea, the average starter motor on a four-cylinder engine will draw somewhere around 100 amps while cranking. So, one of those amps has 1000 milliamps in it. So when we take a look at this, this chart right here, what I want you to really think about is how much current we're talking about. Tingling sensations begin at 0.5 to 3 milliamps. 3 milliamps is three thousandths of one amp. That's an extraordinarily small amount of current. We get uh, we get muscle contractions and pain somewhere around three to ten milliamps. Keep in mind ten milliamps. That's 0 0.010 amps. Uh, let go threshold is somewhere around ten to forty milliamps. The let go threshold is uh, pretty important. What that basically means is that if you are above that ten to forty milliamps, and it varies from person to person, that you will not be able to let go. So whenever you touch wires, I'm going to come around to the front side of the camera here for a second. Whenever you touch wires, we'll say that this here is a wire. Whenever I touch a wire, I always want to backhand the wire. What that means is when I come up to touch it, I'm going to touch the back side of it or I'm going to touch it with the back side of my hand. The reason for this is because if I am going to be electrocuted, it causes muscle contraction. That muscle contraction is going to cause my hand to pull away or clamp down. If I come up and I touch the front side of the wire like this, now it's going to cause it to clamp down and hold on to it. So if we get a, a situation where, where we have 10 to 40 milliamps running through our, through our muscles, we can't let go. So always, always, always backhand wires. Of course, that's backhanding them after you've already gone through the whole power down process, which we'll talk about. Anything uh, between 30 and 75 milliamps is going to cause respiratory paralysis. From 100 to 200, ventricular fibrillation. Uh, from 2 to 500 milliamps, your heart clamps tight. I don't know about you, but that does not sound like a whole lot of fun to me. And around 1500 milliamps, so 1.5 amps, tissue and organs start to burn. So... We want to make sure, we want to make sure that we are not working on any live systems, any live systems at all, we do not want to be working on. We want to safely power the system down before we work on it. When we get into battery packs and we talk about how the service disconnect works in battery packs, 
even with the service disconnect pulled out, the battery pack, once the top is off that battery pack, things are very real. Uh, until you get your bus bars disconnected from your battery pack, until you get each one of those modules broken down from the other modules, the battery voltage is, is extremely high and uh, extraordinarily dangerous. So let's talk personal safety here for a few minutes. Proper attire should be safety glasses, long pants and work shirt, closed toed shoes with rubber soles. No jewelry, watches or rings, that's, uh, that's pretty uh, obvious. And no metal, belt, no metal belt buckles. In addition to that though, what a lot of people don't think about is things they have in their pockets. So something like a pocket screwdriver or something like a nice metal pen. If you're working around hybrid vehicles, <clears throat> especially, especially when you're working around the batteries and the top of the batteries open, if you lean over that battery pack and that pocket screwdriver falls out of your pocket or that metal pen falls out of your pocket and it goes down and causes an arc over, you can have some really, really bad things occur. You can, uh, you can have, you can have cells hit thermal runaway. You can have short circuits that cause for all intents and purposes, battery explosions. Uh, whenever you have the top off of a battery pack, it is a time where you want to have nothing metal on you and you want to be paying attention. You also never leave a battery pack unattended if the top's open or there's any uh, exposure to high voltage. The ANSI or ASTM ratings, uh, ANSI stands for American National Standards Institute and the ASTM is the American Society for Testing of Materials. They basically have different class ratings for gloves. So if you take a look at the top one there, you'll notice that there uh, starts out with a class double zero. Class double zero, the tag color on the glove is beige. It's uh, got a maximum use voltage. If you look at the far right hand side, maximum use voltage of somewhere around uh, 500 volts AC and 750 volts DC. You'll notice that the proof voltage is around 2,500 volts or 10,000 volts. What that basically means is this. Uh, if the glove is going to be rated for its maximum use, they test it at a higher voltage. So it means that it's going to be tested at 10,000 volts DC to make sure that it's okay for 750 volts DC. Or it means it's going to be tested at 2,500 volts AC for a maximum use of 500 volts DC. So we're looking at some pretty significant increases to make sure that this that this glove's gonna be safe. For hybrid, uh, we wanna use a class zero glove. I'll say that one more time, that's really important. For hybrid, we wanna use a class zero glove. The class zero glove is rated to 1000 volts AC or 1500 volts DC with a proof voltage of between, uh, well, 5,000 volts AC and 20,000 volts DC. And if you work your way down to the list, you can see when you get all the way down into class four, which are the orange tags, and that's good for working on voltages of uh, 36,000 AC to 54,000 DC. I don't know about you, but I have no desire at all to work on around uh, 50, 54,000 volts of DC. Uh, <laughs> that actually scares me a little bit. So um, keep in mind, once again, we're going to be using the red, the red tag color, class zero volts, which are rated to 1,000 volts AC. So if you see test questions on that, if you see uh, any type of review questions, uh, class zero, red tag, 1,000 volt. If you take a look at this picture right here, you'll notice on the gloves, you can see that there are tag colors. So right here, there's a tag color here, tag color here. All those tags are all, are all red. So uh, you may not be able to see it. it they almost look orange. It's just the colors off a little bit here, but they're actually red gloves. And so since those are red, those are class zero. Those are rated to a thousand volts, thousand volts AC. A couple of things that you want to notice on that. Let me see if I can zoom this in at all. I'm not sure if it's yeah, right there. A couple of things you may want to notice on that is that you'll see that there's actually testing dates on there. So the one uh, was tested May of 2017. The other one looks like it was December of 2013. What's important there is that you know that those test dates 
are only good for six months. So if I go to grab a set of gloves out of the lab and I see that the date is over six months out on them, those gloves are not safe to be used. Those gloves need to be sent back in and be retested. And the law on it is actually a little bit different. Um, they're good for six months after opening and the last test date is stamped on the glove. So what that means is it means if I were to have a set of gloves tested in January of 2020 and I don't open those gloves until May of 2020, those gloves are supposed to be good six months from the date that I opened them. The problem is, how do you know when they were opened? So if they're your own personal gloves, you may know that. If they're a set of shop gloves or you, or you find them out in our lab, we're going for a six month date period. So ironically, we just had all of our gloves tested and uh, looks like we're not gonna be back in class for a while. So we're gonna have gloves that are going to sit in a box for probably two months since they've been tested, maybe even three months since they've been tested. And when, and when we go back, we'll get a couple months of use out of them and then we have to have them retested again. If you're a technician, it's a really good idea to buy your own gloves so that you know what kind of condition they're in. It's also a good idea to have two pair of gloves. The two pairs of gloves is nice so that you can, uh, when it comes time to get one tested, maybe a month or two out, you send that set of gloves in, have them tested while you're using your others. And then when those gloves come back, you can open those and use those and then send your other gloves out in another couple months to have them tested. That way you always have a set of gloves that is that is within the date. Uh, you'll notice on the right hand side of that picture there that there uh, appears to be another glove over a glove. A couple things about that. Uh, first thing I want to point out is that the rubber glove is longer than the leather glove. You want to make sure that the high voltage glove is longer than the glove that you're putting over it. Because if it's if it's not, you can have you can have an arc travel up that other glove and end up jumping to you. By having your your gloves longer, the the cuff of the glove longer, it provides that 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 extra protection. You'll also notice that the glove is leather, and so that glove is there to protect the rubber glove from abrasions. Keep in mind the leather glove is not there to protect you. The leather glove is there to protect the high voltage glove. The high voltage glove is there to protect you. So uh, keep that in mind. You want to make sure these things are kept clean. Uh, any type of hydrocarbon, uh, gas, oil, grease on the glove will cause the glove to break down and the glove will need to be replaced. So keep these things clean. Uh, keep an over glove on them. In fact, when you're in lab, what I recommend that you do is you put on a you put on a regular latex lever latex under glove before you put your rubber glove on and then before you put your leather glove on. So you could theoretically have three sets of gloves while you're working on a car out there in lab. The the latex glove underneath is because it's a shared it's a shared glove between you and some of your classmates and uh, we don't know if they wash your hands or not. High voltage glove testing. What we're going to do is we're going to grab the glove. I'm going to back up one slide here for just a second. We want to grab the glove right down here at the very end of its cuff. And we want to fold that over and start to roll that glove up. As we start to roll that glove up, what you'll notice is that, is that the fingers will start to hold air. And as we roll that up, it should partially inflate that glove. We wanna hold that glove inflated for a minute. We wanna make sure it's not bleeding down. We wanna make sure there's no air leaks around it. So that's a, that's a habit that you've gotta get into. Every single time you put those gloves on, you test them first. Not once a day, not once a month, Every single time you put those gloves on, you test them first. It's a great habit to get into. Uh, I posted a YouTube video that has a that has a or a YouTube link that has a video of a of a technician testing these gloves so that you can actually see it being done live. As far as high voltage glove sizing, 
you take a look at the uh, sizes on the gloves when whenever you get back to lab there and you'll notice some of them are nine some are tens ten and a half basically the size of the glove is the distance around your your palm there and you can see you can see in the picture the person has taken the measure or the tape measure and uh, it looks like it's about a nine inch about a nine inch glove is what they need Okay, it uh, looks like we're about 20 minutes into this lecture. We're going to end this one so I can upload it, and we'll pick back up again in a few minutes, and I will continue on.